So, uh, hi all. Uh, welcome to this uh, very special day uh, in which uh, we are um, going to discuss uh, theoretical interpretation of uh, uh, the recently reported Xenon anomaly. So, the format is that uh, we invited uh, many speakers but for very short talks. So, let's go straight to the point. Uh, let's try to stay on time. And uh, to optimize the flow of the presentations, I suggest that uh, uh, we just let each speaker uh, finish the presentation and then we ask uh, questions. So without further ado, let's get uh, started. The first speaker is uh, Moto Suzuki. And uh, please, Moto, what are your thoughts about uh, the anomaly? Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Moto Suzuki. I'd like to thank the Professor Sturmia and the organizers for inviting us today. Today, I talk about the uh, new explanation about the xenon one to excess by the inelastic dark matter electron scattering. Xenon uh, collaboration has reported excess of electron recoil events around 2 to 3 keV. And this excess may be explained by new physics. What we consider is the uh, uh, inelastic downscattering of dark matter with the electron. Heavier dark matter chi 2 scatter with the electron, and this heavier dark matter converted into the lighter dark matter chi 1. And a naive expectation is if the, this mass difference of dark matter is KB scale, then electron may obtain the KB scale recoil energy. This is our basic idea. One example model is like this, and we cons consider the U1 gauge theory with a complex scalar field phi. Chi1 and chi2 is a real scalar field. If this U1 symmetry is not broken, the mass of chi1 and chi2 is degenerate. However, once this U1 symmetry is spontaneously broken, the mass of chi1 and chi2 can be split. And dark matter interact with electron via the kinetic mixing between the Zark photon and the standard model photon. This is our setup. And next question is, what is the event rate? To compute the event rate, uh, we generalize the method in elastic scattering. The cross-section for dark matter velocity V is given here, and sigma E is a free electron cross-section, and A0 is a Bohr radius. And Q is a normal, normal of transferred momentum, and ER is a recoil energy. And this K is so-called atomic excitation factor. This atomic excitation factor, roughly saying, this includes the information about the overlap of wave function between the initial state electron in the atom and the final state electron, which is free. And in this plot, I show the atomic excitation, excitation factor as a function of transfer momentum. As we can see, if this Q becomes smaller, the excitation factor becomes large, larger, and when this Q is around the 40 kV, this K becomes maximum. This property is mainly determined by the n equals 3 state because this, the binding energy of this state is around kV. And this peak appears because uh, uh, 1 over Q scale around here match with the size of wave function of n equals 3. Another important point is the Q plus and Q minus integration limits. These limits are determined by the energy conservation. In this plot, I show the Q plus and Q minus as a function of delta mass difference. For the delta equals zero, uh, this corresponds to the elastic scattering case and the integration range is here. And if we consider the finite delta, that corresponds to inelastic scattering. And as we can see, if this mass difference is equal to recoil energy, Q minus can be zero. This property is a big difference from the elastic scattering. In more details, uh, for the elastic scattering, Q minus is, is roughly given by the recoil energy over V. So this is MEV scale. So integration range is roughly uh, larger than the MEV scale. On the other hand, in case of inelastic scattering, Q minus can be zero. 
So integration range includes uh, around Q equal 40 KB. Therefore, max K is available. As a result, after the integration of Q, uh, we observe a peak around the recoil energy equal to mass difference. And differential event rate is given by here. And NT is the number density of xenon atoms, and N chi 2 is the number density of heavier dark matter. And, and this is a differential cross section. And event rating for the inelastic scattering is given here. And, and we confirm the event rate of inelastic scattering is larger, uh, 10 to the six times larger than the uh, event rate of elastic scattering. So before going to our summary plot, uh, let me briefly explain about the dark matter abundance. Dark matter communicate with the standard one sector through the dark photon, and total number density is conserved after the freeze out of this annihilation into the standard model particles. And even after the freeze out, chi 1 and chi 2 continue to be converted to each other. Like for, for example, like this process. And once the dark matter temperature becomes less than the mass difference, the number density of chi 2 decreases exponentially and freeze out. After this freeze out, the number density of chi 2 is, uh, is conserved because chi 2 is stable. We also confirmed the uh, lifetime of dark matter is much longer than the X ray bound. And this is our summary plot. And in left figure, dark photon can decay into the two dark matter. And on right figure, dark photon only decay into a standard mole sector. And on this black line, xenon one ton excess can be explained by the uh, event rate 100. And on this blue line, uh, current dark matter abundance can be explained by the summer freeze out process. And these uh, color shaded region are uh, excluded, uh, constrained by the several experiments. And one important point is in both cases, we observe a we find a nice point where the xenon one ton excess and the dark matter abundance can be explained simultaneously. This is our result. Conclusion. So we have proposed a new explanation about the xenon one ton excess uh, by the uh, down, inelastic down scattering of dark matter with the electron. And we found the uh, uh, scattering rate is significantly enhanced. And this enhancement is not seen for elastic scattering, and it is, uh, it is interesting for application to other direct detection experiments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. So, um, questions? Hey, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Uh, so it is crucial here that uh, the uh, decay into photons is low enough. Uh, no? And you achieve uh, because uh, you have uh, three photons. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens if you know, this guy is, uh, for example, uh, a fermion instead of, rather than a scalar? Oh, so sorry, I cannot hear. So, so your question is this point, so? Yes, uh, so uh, if uh, this uh, chi is, uh, has some different spin, uh, do you still get uh, this big suppression uh, in the gamma? So, sorry, different spin? Uh, sorry, this is a uh, scalar particle. Sorry, sorry, I just... As he yeah. So if it is a scalar, yeah. no, you have a decay to three gamma, and then you get this uh, very big uh, suppression. Yes, yes. So what happens if the spin is different? In particular, can you find a model where you can explain at the same time uh, the xenon anomaly and uh, the three point kV uh, gamma peak anomaly? Oh, I... I didn't know. Sorry. 
I, I can answer quickly. So in the case of fermion, the annihilation cross section always contains S wave, so there's difficulty for the CMB experiment. I mean the, the indirect direction. Ah, uh, fermion. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Francesca, do you want to ask a question? Hi, uh, I have a question about the uh, elastic channel. So you gave us uh, the, the, this diagram where the dark photon coupling to chi1 and chi2 is inelastic, but when you write down the model, do you also have uh, an elastic channel? And if yes, is there any bound on this elastic scattering cross-section from other experiments? Also, elastic scattering case is Oh. oh, elastic scattering. I think in elastic scattering is uh, constraint from the elastic scattering is large, uh, severe. So, for example, in this plot, uh, we consider the in, uh, dark matter scattering with uh, nucleon. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just wondering if, I mean, when you, when you write down the model, you are mm -hmm. likely also to use an elastic coupling, k1, k1, dark photon. So do you have any other bounds from that? And maybe that's the red region in your plot. Uh, uh, that is suppressed because, yeah, k1, elastic scattering suppressed, so constraint is so small. I think constraint is so small. Suppressed by what? Uh, because the k2 and k1, and we need a one more photon. That so you don't have that at three level, not even with a different Lorentz structure. Uh, sorry. I remember for fermion, the vector current is elastic, inelastic, but the axial current uh, sorry, is sorry. elastic, for example. So I was wondering for this, I don't remember if for the scalar you have that or not. So here, here at the three level, there is no, for example, chi, chi two, chi two, dark photon okay. vertex. So it should be sub, very surplus. Okay, so it's, it's, it's only a one loop, okay. Okay, uh, Filippo? Uh, hello, uh, how about, so from the plot you showed before, uh, you require masses below 10 MeV. How about PBM constraint? Up here? Uh, you mean this plot? Uh, no, sorry, it's 30 MeV, 40. Never mind. I mean, you have M1 yes. is roughly half of MA, so I read 20 MeV, so never mind. It should be. 10, yeah, we take into account, the, for example, delta NFA constraint, but the, yeah, this is not so significant. So, yeah, cosmology constraint is not so significant. Okay, okay. Case. Thanks. Other questions, sir? Hi, can I ask a question? It's Andrea Caputo. Please. Please. Okay, uh, what about instead like, uh, so maybe you don't have here, it's a silly question, but you don't have like um, uh, CMB distortion in this model? CMB distortion? Like this will depend of course, like from the like abundance of the two guys, but if they annihilate, usually you get like- uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, annihilation, annihilation, constraint from annihilation is suppressed because uh, in our case, we use the scalar particle, so PA, Ah, so because like it's P wave, so that gets yes, rid yes. of all the bounds. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, hi, uh, can, 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 can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Anish. Uh, so uh, I have a cur cur curiosity. So from the figure uh, right now on, on your screen, does the dark, dark, I mean, does the dark photon also work for at around, let's say, 17 MeV? Because we have a beryllium an anomaly at around 17 M M MeV. So, so I can... Seven? Yeah, so, so, so we ha have an uh, beryllium an 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 anomaly from the atom key experiment. Which uh, is, so uh, application to the beryllium anomaly? Yes, yes. So uh, sorry, uh, uh, we, I didn't check, but yeah. If if it's possible, to eat it is the same. Okay. Uh, let me see if there are other questions. Um, if not, uh, let's thank Moto again for this uh, very clear talk, and let's uh, um, 
I invite uh, Ardi to share uh, his presentation. Ardi, can you hear me? Yes. Ah. Okay, so uh, one second. So, can you see the? I see the PDF. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Is it okay? Uh, yes. So. Okay. So. Uh, oh. Uh, I will uh, uh, briefly discuss about uh, dark matter uh, that uh, that scatters elastically from uh, electrons. So. Uh, one second. <coughs> so because uh, because the uh, solar actions were not the best, uh, or any particle that's produced in the sun that's uh, light enough uh, is uh, can be uh, in tension with uh, with solar cooling or even uh, even ruled out by it. Uh, then we looked at uh, slightly heavier dark matter candidates that uh, scatter uh, yeah. elastically from from uh, from electrons so and uh, we try to do a mostly uh, model independent uh, study so uh, there are models uh, talks about models that will discuss this uh, later so i will uh, uh, not spend too much time on the specific models that uh, will uh, will produce this but uh, this in the simplest case so the, the spectrum can be understood in terms of uh, of kinematics so when the when the dark matter particle is much uh, much heavier than the electron, so uh, uh, right now I, I'm just looking at the most naive uh, model uh, where the dark matter particle scatters off an electron, uh, non uh, non relativistically, and uh, when the particle is much heavier, then uh, the velocity saturates, so it just bounces off uh, electron just bounces off the dark matter particle and. Uh, and uh, gains the velocity that's twice the velocity of dark matter. And, uh, and when we pl plug in the numbers, then we see that the velocity has to be uh, large, 10% uh, of, the, of the speed of uh, light. And uh, when the dark part matter particle gets uh, lighter, then uh, we need an even uh, larger velocity to get the same recoil. So, which means that even a very uh, naive computation gives uh, uh, gives uh, semi-relativistic or nearly uh, relativistic dark matter particles. Uh, so, to do to do this in detail, we of course have to account that. Uh, uh, that the elect uh, dark matter sc that doesn't scatter off uh, free electrons, but uh, uh, of the electrons in xenon. And uh, as was shown in the previous talk, the uh, electrons, uh, or the, the, the velocities inside uh, the xenon atom can be uh, uh, comparable to the velocities, velocities of, of dark matter. So it, it's not completely uh, trivial. And I will not go over this uh, uh, formula in detail. Uh, what we used uh, so briefly is that uh, we assume the dark matter form factor that's uh, one, which uh, corresponds to heavy uh, mediators. Uh, and uh, a second point here is that, uh, that the rate, the uh, magnitude of the signal depends on the on the product of uh, of the dark matter number density and uh, uh, cross section. So the cross section is computed at the fixed momentum transfer. Yeah. So it's just a number. So and uh, when we do the the fit, then uh, this roughly uh, uh, capture. Uh, uh, the qualitative behavior is, is captured by the by the naive expectation that we have a, a constant uh, a velocity at uh, at high dark matter masses, and then it grows when the dark matter mass uh, is below the electron mass. So, 
and uh, we get the lower bound at one sigma that has to uh, that the dark matter mass has to be above five percent of the of the you know, speed of uh, light. And uh, we also uh, fit that uh, uh, the signal with tritium, uh, assuming a free tritium abundance. And uh, since the tritium uh, signal doesn't fit uh, the, the observation so well, then it doesn't affect uh, uh, the fit too much. So the, the, the best fit is still, uh, well, the tritium, abundance, abund uh, the tritium contamination is, uh, is uh, negligible. Uh, so moving on, so let's look at some uh, some some uh, specific uh, spectra. As we can see that uh, if the dark matter, so uh, the red and the orange lines correspond to the best fit scenarios for one GV and ten MeV dark matter with the velocity that's ten percent of the speed of light, and. Uh, and as we can see that if we, uh, if we reduce the mass or the velocity of dark matter, then uh, uh, the recoil is of course smaller and this generates too many events in the first beam. Uh, and this is disfavored. And uh, just a comment uh, about this, if we have, so uh, this uh, assumes uh, uh, monochromatic distribution of velocities in principle. If, if, if the velocity distribution, uh, if we have high velocity dark matter particles from the tail uh, of some distribution, then uh, it would also be expected that we get uh, a too large signal in the, in the, in the first bin, which is uh, disfavored. So, and uh, we can also fit, uh, fit the cross section, which is uh, yeah, shown in the in the panel on the right. Uh, okay, so uh, and that's uh, that's that's more or less. Is that if you want to, to explain this signal with the uh, uh, with the heavier dark matter candidate uh, that's elastically scattering. The dark matter that's too fast to be bound to the dark matter halos. So uh, we can, uh, I will briefly speculate uh, on the on the source of this, uh, but uh, this is mo more or less covered by the by the following talks. So a simple model would be captured uh, by Earth and semi annihilation. So the uh, we look at the, at the dark matter, dark matter, semi annihilation into dark matter and uh, light particles. Uh, so this can easily generate heavy, a heavy mono, mono energetic flux. And, uh, and uh, captured by Earth, so that uh, the Earth captures dark matter quite efficiently and reaches equilibrium. So the influx in, into the Earth and the flux from the Earth are in, in equilibrium can, uh, could be consistent with uh, with direct detection bounds and uh, and this for example could explain the signal signal in, in general it could have dark matter particles that uh, annihilate uh, to lighter dark matter candidates that then uh, interact with uh, with electrons or uh, finally you could have uh, some more exotic scenarios like dark stars where the dark matter uh, is uh, converted to to relativistic or fast dark uh, uh, matter particles in, inside some exotic, uh, more exotic objects like dark stars or action stars. But uh, in this case, uh, since there is a, a, the, they, they should not uh, produce uh, many photons as uh, would be the case typically for action stars. So the coupling to photons should be uh, suppressed. So, uh, and that's, uh, that's the brief talk uh, by me. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, let me see if there are questions from the audience. Uh, maybe I can just ask a curiosity. Uh, so what happens if you change your assumption of uh, the form, about the form factor?
Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, I, I can add uh, the comment uh, if you want. Yeah. Um, well, if you have a light mediator, of course, it doesn't help because it tends to give you less recoil. If you have instead a form factor proportional to Q, to Q squared, so something like a pseudoscalar mediator, it would help. But um, it's not needed, that's the point. Okay, thanks. And uh, one comment also is that so the, since the kinematic roughly determines the, uh, the spectrum, then uh, unless you have very drastic velo velocity dependencies, then we don't expect that it changes the fit too much. Okay, thanks. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, I, I have a hello. Hi, please uh, ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, please. Uh, my question is how this graph changes when you, uh, or do you have an idea like how this graph changes when you change the assumption of non relativistic to relativistic case? Uh, when the dark matter particles are. Then I will make the situation. Uh, can you repeat your answer because uh, there was a problem in the connection? Okay, we lost the speaker. Uh. We lost the speaker. <laughs> so uh, it becomes uh, like actions. Uh. Okay, if you want to add the comment, otherwise we can postpone the question uh, to the end of the session. Okay, go. Uh, so, uh, well, let's move on to the next speaker then. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry. Jing Shu. Can you share full screen? Jing, you, you are muted. No, that's true. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Mm. Hello? Hi. Okay, okay. So, next so hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm very glad to give a talk here, and it's about two papers. So my name is Jin Su from Institute of Theoretical Physics, Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing. So today I will talk about two explanations. The first one is the boosted dark matter explanation for this xenon one time anomalies. And the second one is that uh, this dark matter actually are uh, accelerated from the scattering in the sun, which is the reflection scenario. So I first talk about the boosted dark matter. So the boosted Dark matter, there are several different models in the past. And uh, it can be, for instance, the semi annihilation, so which is the C3, or like a two component. And uh, for those boosted dark matter, they have a, their thermal annihilation. They could be from the galactic center. So those dark matter flux can be from the galactic center. And uh, if they are thermal produced, we can calculate the flux according to their thermal annihilation. Accordingly, there are also possibilities that you can have them from the solar capture and from at the sun. And the capture rate by the dark matter nuclear interaction like this. And uh, then they annihilate and give you the dark matter flux, which are coming from the sun. 
And uh, by having this uh, boosted dark matter flux, and one can calculate the signal rates, which is in the signal 110. And these are the, uh, the Lambo events that you are. Transmit and also the dark matter electron cross action. And basically, I mean, if one wants to have 100 signals, probably that's the typical, for instance, the, the cross action that one can see. And also, that we can see that how to realize this cross action, one can imagine a media happy act like a mediator actually doing the job. And one can choose, for instance, a benchmark, benchmark point with soft relatively a mirrored boot, which has been already said in the previous talk. But what is important is that the penetration length for this boosted dark matter. So inside the core, actually, because the sun core is very dense, that the, the mean free the penetration, um, the, the scattering length actually is very small. And then we can find that the even at the sun, when they are produced and are annihilated, you cannot actually escape coming outside of the sun. So basically, in this case, it's very difficult that you get the flux from the sun. And similarly, you, if you have the boosted dark matter capture through the dark matter electron interaction. On the other hand, for the Earth's core, it's not that dense. And we can see that, for instance, for the signal one time, it's one, one kilometer down. So basically, the, the, the one um, scattering is like six meters. And in this case, your dark matter um, adjusts a very slow down a very little bit, like 10% or 1%. And in this case, your Earth is actually semi opaque. That means that the, the flux cannot penetrate the Earth when it's uh, actually back to the flux source direction. However, if your um, the detector is actually pointing to the flux, then you can actually see that. So there is a very interesting daily modulation of the signal. And also, one can calculate the recoil energy spectrum. I guess mostly is actually summarized in the previous talk. In our case, in the limit that your dark matter is much bigger than the electron mass, so you can do this by simplify a lot of calculations, and then it's just a step function. And after considering the threshold and also the detector smearing, and that's what you see. And the, the, the fit is actually pretty good. But what is more is actually the daily modulation, which is something that we want, really want to emphasize. So if you actually see that the daily modulation, think about the sidereal time, that if you coming from the galactic center, which is like a, a sort of uh, almost a fixed place, and then you can actually see that the, the distance that you have to travel through the, the rocks is basically like that. And one can also calculate the, the stopping distance, which is roughly here. And then we can see that basically for 1,000 kilo, kilometers, that here you will see the, almost the, the full uh, signals. While here, on the other hand, you are completely, they cannot uh, pass. So in the end, you're, you are expecting a daily modulation, which looks like this, almost a step function, assuming that the survival probability is a step function. And what is more important is that the central value, the central value actually means your, your uh, signal one time experiment is actually pointing to the sources. So this actually tells you that the, the, the time for the daily modulation with the pink signal also means actually the direction for the boosted dark matter flux. So this is very cool. Basically, the Zilong is a non-directional experiment. But on the other hand, by doing this daily modulation, you actually know the direction of the boosted dark matter flux. So this actually opens a very interesting um, signal that the experimentalists can search. Because then, we, not only we probably see that this is not like a trillion uh, beta decay or something, it actually tells you that uh, where is the source. For instance, if the direction is not pointed to the galactic center or it's not pointed to some specific places, maybe we can see that this may come from a, a nearby dark matter subhalo or mini cluster. Of course, the sun possibilities uh, is still need to be considered. 
So the sun actually when they modulate because actually you have the, the winter and the summer, which tells you that the, the daytime is different. So then basically the 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 distance which you travel is also slightly different. In the winter time, basically that uh, the 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 time that it can can pass through is actually smaller. While at the summer time, the the time the the, the dark matter flux can pass through to the detector is bigger. So there's a, not only has a daily normalization, you have also has a seasonal effects. And these uh, we will do a more detailed analysis in the future. And uh, for such kind of things. So we can probably imagine that there is an intermediate fire particle which helps to escape from the sun, that they, they have a much bigger, you know, the, the scattering lens. And then they, they basically decay when they in, into the bees, which is in the, in the you know, uh, outside of the, uh, in, in between. And then we see the signal of the bees. So in the end, uh, the, there are more details to be done for this modulation. We already consider the full possibilities for the daily modulation, sun and, and nearby, for instance, subhalo mini cluster. On the other hand, um, there are things like uh, the rock densities and also the, the real energy loss, which tell to the real surviving probability. We consider has to consider the sun signal effects and probably think about other experiments like LC or Panda X or other things. Now I go to the second talk with the sign hidden dark matter interpretation. So in this case, actually, it, it's interesting in a sense that it applies to any kind of dark matter. It, it don't, you really don't have to tune the details of the dark matter models. And then I will say heated, and, and originally it's a very nice paper, which is the sun reflected. But uh, the dark matter original speed probably is not that big, it's very small, and then it's boosted by the heat of the sun, then we say it's heated, but actually the, the meaning is the same. So in this case, we choose the benchmark where the, there is a maximum momentum transfer, which basically is that your dark matter is the same mass as your electron, which is 0 0.5 MeV. So in this case, uh, one basically needs a real simulation for that how the, the dark matter is accelerated inside the sun. But however, that can, cannot be done in a very quick time. So what we did is a very rough, uh, rescaling method. So here is the thing. So this is the plot that from the original paper, which tells that the how the flux actually goes. So this place is the Boltzmann distribution, and this place is really the how the dark matter accelerated by the sun. So the important thing is that for the smaller dark matter electron cross section, then basically they have a bigger reflection lens, and then basically they, they will be probing more inside of the sun core. So the temperature is higher and the flux are even harder. And in this case, you can see that when the cross section is much smaller than one picobar, they don't really depend on other things. The only dependence you can see is actually the, the dark matter electron uh, gathering cross section. So in this case, you can see the shape is almost the same. That for instance, the, the two only differs by the total normalization. So this is the region we are actually considering and do the rescaling. So we can see that you, even for a very small, relatively small cross section like 10 to the minus 18, 38 or something, we can just, uh, just do the normalization. Where the normalization actually is just coming from here. The other thing that we have to change, this is the plot for three MeV. So we basically have to change that into the 0 0.5 MeV. And this we just use the end point as the handle. So this end point is defined to be the 95% of the flux. They, they don't mean that it's the end of the, the all flux. And this 5% of the flux here actually is the most important one that you give to the, the, the signal. So you can't miss it. And in this case, for instance, the 0 0.5 MeV, you can see the end point is here. While for the 3 MeV, they don't have it, but roughly speaking, we can just average of those two. And then you get one end point. And for these two endpoints, we know that for the smaller cross section, the shape is the same. So we just move them to the right. And that, that basically is how we get the, the, the benchmark velocity distribution. And the basic that looks like here. Notice that this is the velocity, not the energy, and also it's not a, not a log. So it looks a little bit different. Two minutes. And then we can calculate the event fraction, which uh, I think the previous speaker already talked about it. What is important is that uh, there are several constraints that one has to consider. 
and one probably first uh, jump out is the low threshold dark matter experiment. So basically, this is the original paper by by the reflection pe people, and uh, here is uh, our benchmark. So we can see that the benchmark is actually uh, lies outside the expected limit of this sensing experiment. And uh, also there are some cosmology bounds, actually BBN or N effective, and they prefer a relatively light mediator. So, so the, this had to be also considered that you one had to use the light mediator in order to not conflict with those cosmology bounds. And uh, for the current, uh, for instance, the low threshold experiment like SR2 was fancy because uh, we people actually don't have the uh, simulation code for the velocity distribution. So basically one didn't really just uh, implement and do this uh, constraint. I mean, this constraint, I guess, is, uh, origin, is just from the uh, original paper. So what we did, and also the SR2 probably right now is still, I mean, stronger than the sensei. So basically what we did is that we considered this uh, uh, velocity distribution and also in the paper they have this efficiency and all of those things. We just very naively, I mean, times them together and calculate it. So in the end, uh, I mean, forget about the background. Uh, so we should, you, you know, we still have some uncertainty and we really don't know that. But at, at least we can see that the sign reflection benchmark point we, we choose is, is uh, still relatively, you know, be, be below the, the, the signal. So at least the currently is safe. But in the future, definitely the future low threshold dark matter experiment will probe this interesting possibility. So here is my summary that boosted dark matter interpretation, it works fine. And the boosted dark matter flux, it comes from the galactic center. And when it comes from the sun, actually it's a little bit subtle, it doesn't escape out, but probably you can do just play some, consider some intermediate particles or something to get us get a read of it. And also uh, there's a possibility from the earth that we, we, we haven't ch checked carefully. And also there's a very interesting striking daily modulation signal. And this is really, I believe the key heart of the, the paper that it actually can even know the direction of the signal source. It can also tell us that whether or not it is from the training contamination, the training double beta decay or something else. So this is really something that we are expecting to check in the future. On the other hand, for the sun heated dark matter, it's a very clean model. We don't need to do so many specific assumptions and it can help the feed for the spectrum. And the currently is consistent with the low threshold experiment. And definitely you can imagine in the future, the future experiment will probe the, those regions. And the, the, the key thing that we are writing this paper for our series to think about it, I think it's important that uh, we series to not only propose uh, 10,000 kinds of model, but also actually from the model, we really point out the possibility, point out any kind of other kinematics or, or any kind of directions that experimentalists in the future can, can search for. And that is what we are, I, I mean, at least for, for our series, the main, main goal of that. So I will stop here. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions? I see a question in the chat by Sergei Blinikov. Uh, Sergei, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear. Yeah. Then please ask uh, the question. Uh, my question is if you predict some modulations, seasonal modulations just due to irradiation, maybe there is a modulation due to difference in distance. In winter, we are closer to the sun by several million kilometers and distance enters uh, like a square. So maybe there is uh, I, modulation and uh, just flux uh, reflected from sun. Right, but, but that, that, that part I believe is relatively sm small comparing to the so big modulations which, which we already show here. And also the, the signal, another big signal effect is that the, basically, you know, the, what can I say? The, 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 the new, new. So, so basically, I mean, at the, you know, the, the I actually just don't know how to describe, you know, this earth movement in, 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 in English, but uh, what I say is that the, the, the effect that makes your daytime longer and uh, smaller, 
those are the thing that is relatively more uh, affect more than the distance effect. Of course, I, I, I think what you point out is important that in the future, we definitely will include the, the other detailed effects like the distance effect. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Uh, if not, let's just thank Jing Shu again for the, the very nice presentation. And uh, let's move to the next speaker, uh, with Wen Yin. Wen, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, ah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, okay, I will share uh, my screen. Uh, Okay. okay. So next speaker is so, uh, please uh enjoy. Okay, uh thanks. Uh so uh I will be talking about the Xenon Wanto, I mean the implication of Xenon Wanto mm -hmm. access to uh Arc Dark Matter. So this talk is mainly based on the paper uh, here. It is in collaboration with Fumi Takahashi and Masaki Yamada in Tokyo University in Japan. So first of all, uh, I want to say that the uh, uh, bosonic dark matter is a good candidate explaining the xenon quantum excess. Uh, this figure is taken from the uh, 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 slide of the seminar talk. Uh, given by uh, Michel Galloway uh, for Zeno one tone. Uh, so we can find that the, the uh, mono energetic peak around 2.3 kb uh, is favored over the background only at the three sigma level. So this means that the, uh, that the um, arc dark matter with coupling to electron can explain the uh, uh, excess at the three sigma level. The coupling uh, of the electron uh, to, to the electron is defined like this. So this is the mass of electron divided by the uh, uh, decay constant of the arc. Here QE is an order one coefficient. Uh, this is the PQ charge of electron. PQ means the pitch green symmetry relevant to the arc. Okay, then we can convert this result to the favorable region at the three sigma level for the arc. Uh, the, for the arc that matter, I mean. The mass is around 2.3 kb. The uh, coupling to electron is around 3 times 10 to minus 14. So, uh, in this talk, the main question I want to answer is whether uh, this arc dark matter explanation is consistent with cosmology and astronomy. This is uh, what I will be talking about. So, first of all, I will show that the arc dark matter to explain the xenon one excess must be anomaly free to photons. Otherwise, there is a, uh, the scenario would be, will be uh, excluded by the observation of the, the X-rays. And even in the anomaly free case, there is a more robust prediction on the X-ray line signal. Uh, I also show that uh, the, the favored lesion is close to the stellar cooling hint. And even better fit can be obtained if the ARP is a subdominant dark matter. And I also show that uh, surprisingly, the, the, the predicted abundance of the ARP by misalignment mechanism is consistent with dark matter abundance. So this is a natural prediction from the, the misalignment mechanism, okay? Uh, now let's uh, consider the ARP dark matter coupled to electron. Suppose that the ARP is only coupled to electron, then we can find that uh, there is a photon coupling from the anomaly. This can be uh, understood by noticing that the, the, the PQ assignment, I mean the charge assignment, is anomalous to photon. Then uh, in the effective theory, by integrating out electrons, we must have this kind of the coupling to photons due to the uh, anomaly matching condition. So since ARP decays to photons, uh, it is a decaying dark matter. 
uh, since the mass is around KB, uh, the decay produces X-rays. So the scenario is tightly constrained from the observation of X-ray. So the constraint gives the upper bound of the coupling to photon. This uh, upper bound can be translated to the, the coupling to electron. It is uh, 10 to minus 18. So this is a very severe constraint, and the favor region is, uh, uh, I mean, excluded. Uh, therefore, the scenario out only coupled to electron is excluded. Uh, similarly, uh, in, in any uh, models, I mean, out dark matter scenario with photon anomaly, the same constraint, the same argument uh, applied. So we must consider uh, anomaly free uh, out dark matter to explain the excess. Okay, so there are various possibilities models uh, charge assignment to realize uh, anomaly free ARP. In any case, in the effective theory, we will have the vanishing uh, uh, anomalous coupling to photons, namely the vanishing of the dimension five term to, to uh, uh, coupling to photons. So this is due to the uh, anomaly matching condition. Uh, on the other hand, we, we can have uh, higher dimensional terms uh, the dominant terms is from the dimension seven terms. Uh, please notice that in the context of the, the uh, general one term, we must have up coupled to electrons. Then there must be a threshold correction coming from the electron in the effective theory. So the, this threshold correction is very likely to be dominant because you know the electron is the lightest uh, charged particle, charged fermion. Uh, then, uh, it, then we can obtain the effective power into photon like this, and we can calculate the decay rate like this. So interestingly, this decay rate is fixed once the mass and the GAE is given. So this is a robust prediction on the decay rate to two photons of the arc. Uh, so this, I mean, this uh, decay rate does not depend on the UV model, how to make the arc anomaly free. Uh, another thing uh, uh, we can notice from the decay rate formula is that the, the decay rate is uh, suppressed by the uh, ratio, I mean, suppressed by the mass of the electrons to the six of them. So the decay rate is basically small. Uh, this is the parameter region of our scenario. The horizontal line is the mass of ARP. Vertical line is the uh, coupling to electron. The uh, purple region, uh, I mean, the purple point is favorable region by the one term. The blue shaded region is excluded from the observation of uh, X ray. And slightly below the uh, blue uh, shaded region, uh, we can find the blue dashed line. This is a sense future sensitivity leach of the uh, uh, X ray observatory, Athena. Uh, so one finds that when the, if the excess was larger than the, uh, the 4 kb or 5 kb, then our scenario can be tested by a future observation of the X-ray line signal. But unfortunately, uh, in the favorable region, it is not the, uh, uh, it is below the ridge. Uh, the gray region, on the other hand, uh, is excluded by the uh, uh, serial cooling. Uh, slightly below the ex extruded lesion, there are uh, cooling hints from white dwarf and red giants. Uh, so, first of all, I, we, we can find that the, the favorable lesion is consistent with the star cooling and the X-ray. And secondly, uh, we can find that this uh, uh, favorable lesion is close to the cooling hint. So this is interesting. Uh, an uh, important question is whether we can have consistent cosmology, whether we can have the uh, consistent abundance of dark matter. Uh, this orange band shows the prediction from the missile mechanism. Uh, here I take the QE order one, the PQ charge of the electron to be order one, the initial missile angle to be order one. Then, uh, so this is a natural prediction from missile mechanism. So means Surprisingly, we found this, yes. There are two minutes. Oh, so, so, Pardon? So, 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 so
Oh, thanks. <laughs> so this is a favored uh, region, and uh, surprisingly, we found that this prediction overlaps with the, the favored region. And so far, we have talked about the, the case that ARP is the uh, dominant dark matter. Uh, so ARP can also be subdominant dark matter. Uh, in that case, we can still explain the the uh, uh, excess. Uh, so uh, in this case, we can explain the exit by increasing the GAE so that we have the same event rate. Uh, so if we decrease the, the abundance of ARP, uh, the, the favorable region goes up, and also the missile alignment mechanism band goes up because they are relevant to the, the abundance of dark matter. On the other hand, the cooling hints does not change because uh, uh, they do not care whether the ARP is dark matter or not. So if we decrease this bounds and the uh, uh, favorable lesion goes up. So we found that the favorable lesion, cooling hints, and missile and prediction coincide with the, the uh, abundance is 1 to 10% of the uh, uh, dominant uh, dark matter abundance. So thank you very much. This is the end of my talk. OK, th th thanks a lot. So questions for when? Disha? Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you go to your uh, uh, last slide uh, where you were showing uh, the constraint plot? This one? Yeah, this, this one. Uh, so actually, I have a doubt uh, which I did not understand by reading the paper also. So the point which you have marked in Stark, uh, the star, is actually consistent with the background, right? Because the green and the yellow shaded region correspond to the background. So I do not understand that how action like particles are explaining the axis if, uh, if most of the points are, uh, you know, lying within this uh, uh, Brazil shaded region. Um, so... So yeah, this is my question. Can you please explain uh, that part? So, so you mean how the axial light particle explain the excess? Of the yeah, uh, so basically the point you have marked is lying in the background region, right? I mean, um, the green and the yellow shaded, this represents the background, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to be honest, we, we didn't uh, uh, fit the data. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I... I um, Actually, yeah. in the paper, so it was mentioned that uh, they uh, do not uh, like uh, 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 like uh, uh, tell any point. Rather, they give upper bounds uh, on the coupling and the mass parameter regime. Uh, so yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, so, so I think they, I yeah I yeah I take take this from the the uh, 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 slide of the the people from the Zilomanto. Uh, Michelle got away, and okay. they—they, they, I think, in the, on the right there is no the favor lesion, but we can basically calibrate the, uh, obtain this this uh, favor lesion. You know, the the process is the the uh, 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 axion uh, absorption. So basically, uh, the mass is correspond to the the peak, and from the event right, we can calibrate the the uh, by assuming that the the, the the dominant dark matter, we can calculate uh, this kind of coupling. We can basically calculate the, the you know, the, uh, uh, absorption rate. Yeah, so we can derive this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I, we, we didn't do the fit. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, for the question, sir? If I may make a comment on, on the previous question. Yeah, sure. Um, so we actually did a fit for hidden photons, which is pretty much the same as um, for axon-like particles. And um, there's a xenon one ton limits and um, the best fit point are well consistent on the expected um, two and a half or three stigma level. So they, they, give, a they give a bound and that is consistent um, with explaining um, the events with a slightly lower coupling than this bound. This is an additional comment. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I think you, you can find, find a fit, fit in the, in the uh, uh, yeah, 
mid yeah <laughs> uh, to I mean uh, later uh, uh, speak and talk. Yeah. Other questions or comments or curiosities for when? Um, so just a quick, a quick one. Uh, so you discussed the, the interplay with the, the computation of the abundance from uh, the misalignment. But for a generic ALP, uh, is it clear that uh, the, the, thermal, uh, the thermal population is negligible? Ah, uh, the, the thermal production, you mean? Uh, so, so to, to, yeah, it, it is very non-trivial. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, that depends on how to couple the ARP to the standard model. Uh, if the, the ARP only couple to uh, 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 electron and the muon, oh, I think I have backups, right? Uh, yeah, this is the, the uh, thermal uh, production uh, abundance. Uh, so, uh, so basically, if we consider the alpha is only coupled to electron and muon, the, the, uh, uh, the thermal production can be suppressed if the reheating temperature is smaller than 10 to 8 degree. Uh, and the, to have the missile mechanism with uh, the uh, uh, reheating temperature greater than so I, I say the prediction of misalignment mechanism meaning that the, the, t, the, the heating temperature greater than the uh, oscillation temperature when the, the coherent oscillation starts. Uh, uh, so if we want to, this oscillation temperature is around 10 to 6 GB. So if we want to have the prediction of misalignment mechanism, uh, we need the heating temperature to be greater than 10 to 6 GB. So if we want to have the coincidence, we have to have the heating temperature greater than 10 to 6 GB. So in this case, uh, we, we, we can actually restrict uh, our model. Uh, for example, we can, we can just consider the ARP only coupled to E and mu to, uh, to have the reheating temperature as high as 10 to 8 GB. But if we consider the electron also, I mean the uh, ARP also coupled to, for example, top uh, uh, quark, then the reheating temperature must be uh, smaller than around the, uh, 10, uh, the electric weak scale. 100 GB. In that case, this coincidence doesn't uh, uh, is not true. Okay, so so it depends on the coupling of the arc to the thermal uh, particles. I see. Thanks. Um, the questions so very quickly. Uh, otherwise, we uh, thank Wen for the talk, and uh, we 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 move on to the next speaker, with Itai Block. Wayne, can you just uh, stop sharing the presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm doing it now. Yeah. Uh, how to stop? <laughs> if I close this, finished. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll be talking about our paper with Andrea Caputo, Ruben Essig, Diego Redigolo, uh, Mukul Shalapurkar, and Tomo Volansky. Um, because the paper is uh, quite long, I'm going to give you sort of the main highlights of it. And of course, you can ask questions if you have a, on anything. So first of all, our analysis, we use the Mo uh, Monte Carlo based analysis, which was based on the uh, uh, detector rec um, um, response and reconstruction effects paper by the Xenon collaboration last year. And we gained a marginally better resolution than the one reported by the Xenon one town collaboration. And just so we're clear, a better resolution is actually usually more conservative, which might be counterintuitive because the signal is quite uh, peaked, right? For at least for the dark matter, it's usually more peaked in general than the access. So if you have a better resolution, you can only explain fewer events. So our analysis was actually quite conservative. Um, First, we considered the case of absorption, uh, already discussed here several times. Uh, we considered axion-like particles, scalars, and dark photons, either of which can either be dark matter or produced in the sun. Um, on the left side, you can see, for example, the spectrum of a, of a bind, uh, sorry, the bind spectrum that we used in unbind analysis. Um, 
for dark photon dark matter okay we gain 3.5 local significance maybe it should be a bit higher compared to the four that was presented earlier but these are just uh, peanuts you know 10 percent correction and on the right hand side you can see basically different models and how they fit where the x-axis is the mass of the particle you absorb and basically the y-axis the way to think about it is the lower it goes the better the spectrum fits to the data so all the different models that we consider the shape uh, fits quite nicely to the to the axis that we look at sorry however while the spectrum uh, fits quite nicely of course stellar probes can exclude some of the models we consider specifically um, the scalar dark matter case and all the solar production uh, models are actually excluded by other stellar probes um, and here you can see for example the dark matter case for the axion that is uh, unexcluded indeed you need to have a, a, a small coupling to photons um, if you consider an axion that is interacting with electrons and on the other hand, if you look at the solar axion uh, uh, that is produced by the Primakov effect, then you see that it is excluded by white dwarfs and red giants um, and is quite robustly excluded. So the uh, approach we took is to try to uh, add a chameleon to the model where basically, sorry, where, where we evade the bounds from the cooling of the white dwarfs and red giants by having um, a coupling to the alpha, which is density dependent. Because the density of white dwarfs and red giant is uh, several orders of magnitude higher than the one of the sun. If you can have the ALP only interact when the density is very low, okay, only sorry, reproduce when the density is very low, then you might evade these bounds. And uh, specifically, just to, you know, to show you, this is uh, um, the basic uh, Lagrangian that we take, where the X is some scalar and the S is some uh, uh, other scalar. And um, the X is getting a VEV only for small densities. And the S, you can see, is bro uh, has, gets also a VEV, and uh, the phase of this S is the ALP, okay? So the A, or the ALP, is the pseudonambu Goldstone boson of some PQ symmetry. And in the end, this is basically the only important, uh, this is the most important, sorry, uh, equation. You get that the coupling of the ALP to the electrons becomes density dependent, and for high densities, you're going to get that the production is significantly suppressed or uh, negligible in, our approxima in this approximation. So indeed, you can see that once you introduce this uh, uh, modeling, then you can evade the bounds from the white dwarfs, the red giant, and the horizontal branch stars, and suddenly the preferred point for the solar production might, be, might remain unexcluded, even if the axion-like particle is not dark matter, could still be uh, uh, produced in the sun, and we would detect this uh, in, sorry, uh, if it is chameleonized, it is not excluded, sorry. So another case we considered in our paper, aside from absorption, is the case of scattering from dark matter to electrons. We considered uh, several scenarios, okay? Um, I'm gonna go over them depending on how much time I'm gonna have. We'll see if I need to drop it, for maybe one. But there's the case of the dark matter scattering, sorry, standard scattering from electrons. There's the case of exothermic dark matter already discussed a bit in the, uh, well, already discussed in one of the previous talks, sorry. And we can also consider the case where the dark matter is accelerated by cosmic rays. Um, once again, the spectrum agrees, agrees quite nicely with most of these models, though here complementary probes are, also, are once again in tension with some of these uh, interpretations for the excess. So if we just want to have a standard electron dark matter scattering, okay, we can consider several, um, sorry, several form factors. We can consider the contact interaction, a light mediator, or a, a linear and Q uh, interaction. And the problem is that the lack of an excess at the 1 to 2 kV bin Okay, as well as bounce from the S2 only analysis pretty much excludes this uh, uh, vanilla model for both the light mediator and the contact interaction because you get a peaked spectrum at the lower energies. On the other hand, the F goes like Q is still a viable model, okay? And we might even be able to explain the observed access in the S2 only analysis that was uh, published for the same data last year, okay? Because there was a bit of an access there, but they didn't have a good background model, so they didn't. Um, claim it as an actual excess. Um, and however, it looks like the cutoff that we want for such an effective coupling that has this form factor might, or might be in tension with Collider, which is something that we're still checking and hopefully will, will be more clear in uh, our version too. So the exothermic case that was already discussed by, by Suzuki in the, the first talk, I think it was, has a, a, a quasi-degenerate dark matter that has two masses, a heavy one and a light one, where the splitting between these two masses is just small, and the heavy guy can scatter off of electrons and uh, uh, scatter, down scatter to the lower mass uh, mode. 
Um, we once again consider here three uh, form factors, the contact interaction, light mediator, and uh, linear in Q model. And um, for high masses, um, you gain that the uh, spectrum is very similar to the absorption case. You're basically peaked around the splitting, okay? You can only move uh, a bit around that splitting uh, while getting a significant uh, uh, rate. While for the low mass case, you can probe more of the energies basically and you get a wider spectrum. So it looks a bit different, though in the end, the, the quality of the fit was quite similar for both high and low masses. Um, it was not exactly the same, but it was quite similar. And indeed, uh, any of these three form factors appear to work, oops, sorry, appear to work quite well. Um, we have not yet done a careful examination of whether it might be excluded by any other uh, uh, direct detection probe, but it seems like um, they are not. And uh, therefore, this indeed might be, uh, this might be very interesting. And just to, you know, to show you a bit, these are the spectrums that we get for the F dark matter proportional to Q and for the F dark matter proportional to one. And one interesting thing is to understand exactly how the relic densities the relative relic densities of the heavy dark matter compared to the light dark matter are changed depending on the exact model details, okay? And that is something that we have not uh, uh, entirely done. So for now, we're just showing you the, the cross-section scale according to the fractional uh, relic abundance of uh, the heavy dark matter particle. Um, so um, yeah, indeed. So here you can see basically what happens, the, the sigma bands for what happens if we fix the mass of the particle. Okay, compared to if we miss the, we fix, sorry, the splitting. And the reason why these cut off on the edges is just because you, the spectrum was, is, uh, sorry, the sigma bands are actually very wide and we're, uh, we're not showing them right now, but in version two, we're, we're also gonna have that. So the last model I will be discussing is accelerated dark matter. Um, collisions with cosmic rays can accelerate the dark matter to velocities much larger than the regular virial velocity. And thus, they allow the sub-GV dark matter to be detectable uh, um, compared to otherwise where the um, energy it can deposit is much too small. Um, the two main experiments that would constrain the spectrum of such models are, first of all, the super-K experiment, which is relevant to the 10 MeV energies, much higher than the energies that we observe this excess in. And the other one is the S2-only analysis of the same SR1 uh, data, which is relevant at the 0 0.186 kV or 0 0.2 kV, whatever, up to a kV approximately. So it's a bit lower energy than what we observe. Okay, so the form factor that we choose that should be able, that evades both of these guys is a form factor that looks like the one I show here. Basically, at high uh, Q, you get the form factor that looks like one over Q, and um, because you need to first scatter off of a cosmic ray. And then you need to scatter off of the xenon to, for the particle to be both accelerated and then detected. Then you basically get uh, uh, the cross section squared, which means that you go like the form factor to the fourth power, which means that the one over Q is enough to evade the super K experiment. And on the other hand, um, the, for low uh, um, energies, okay, where the S2 only analysis is relevant, you evade it by having this dependence that goes like Q. Okay, when the me mass of the, me of the mediator in this model is higher than this Q. And therefore you can evade both of these bounds, okay? Um, and here you can see indeed uh, for one specific, uh, um, we chose here to show for, the ratio, for a ratio of one over 15 between the mass of the mediator and the mass of the dark matter. Okay, you see that indeed we are able to evade both the xenon one ton S2 only bound as well as the super K uh, um, bound. Uh, we, were, we are able to evade both of them by having this form factor. And uh, the problem is, however, that it looks like the, the scalar mediator that we need would be excluded specifically by, the, by measurements of G minus two. Um, though, as you can see in this plot, there are also uh, two other, uh, there's the horizontal branch stars and uh, the phytomerization for the and effective bounds basically, which might be a bit more model dependent, but still this model of, uh, appears to be quite robustly excluded, at least in the way we checked it, but there might be ways to evade this. And I should also mention that we assumed something for the spectrum that might be unrealistic because the cosmic ray spectrum has only been measured uh, as low as one MeV, while uh, what we really want is energies below one MeV. Um, sorry, while energies below one MeV might be relevant, sorry. And um, then we assume that the spectrum drops down to zero. If you do some naive inter in extrapolation, sorry, where the spectrum keeps on rising like it was rising before, 
um, then you get too many events for the S2-only analysis, which can use the low energy spectrum. So it is unclear. It might require a more careful examination of what exactly is and isn't realistic for the spectrum of the cosmic rays themselves. Not the, not, I mean, dark matter, of course, is affected by that. And uh, thank you for listening. That's it. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, so I have a question. Here is Luca yeah. Lucio. Um, so when you discuss the, how to evade the um, bounds from uh, white dwarfs and uh, other solar system, so you assume a coupling of uh, scalar to the density of the star. You, uh, of, yes, the scalar, yes, the excess scalar. Yes. Yeah, I was just looking at your paper, how this, yeah. and, uh, this verb is activated. And I, I was just wondering what, what could be the UV origin of such a coupling? Do you have something in mind? Um, I think currently uh, we have some work in progress about it, but I mean, at least not for this paper. This paper is considering only the phenomenological aspects of that. I don't, I mean, for now at least we're not considering the chameleonized model from a UV-complete perspective yet. But Luca, it could be something like a dilaton, for instance. You have many, any, any scalar that couples to density could have something like that. It's not... What's special about it, it is that it, it's an X squared coupling and not an X coupling. There were papers by, uh, by Justin Curry long ago, it's called the, the, the Symmetron. And that's the type of, uh, of scenarios that we, we expect and it requires model two. Yeah. Uh, it looks interesting because you can uh, maybe also rescue uh, solar actions in this way. Yeah, that, that's what we're doing, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Or comments? Mm -hmm. uh, if not, we move to the last speaker of this session. But first, we thank it again for this uh, very uh, nice talk. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Leonard. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Hi. can you hear me too? I'll try to share my screen. Okay, so just go ahead. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. I will talk about the possibility that the xenon one ton axis could be caused by hidden photon dark matter. We've heard a bit about that before, but I will focus on how stellar cooling observations turn out to be an asset of this explanation. So this is based on a short note that my colleagues and I put on the uh, archive about a week ago. Um, in the course of this uh, short talk, I will address uh, three key questions. Firstly, whether the xenon uh, one ton axis can indeed be satisfactorily explained by the hidden photon dark matter. Um, secondly, if uh, a hidden photon of the kind required to explain the signal uh, is a viable dark matter candidate. And lastly, I will discuss how the hidden photon compares with uh, stellar cooling observation. So briefly, what's the setup that we are considering? A hidden photon, or often also called dark photon, is the gauge field of a new U1 uh, symmetry. And we denote this new field and its field strength tensor here, x. Uh, we assume that this field receives a mass term, either through a Higgs or a Stückelberg mechanism, and that the hidden photon is kinetically mixed uh, with the standard model electromagnetic uh, field by a small mixing parameter, epsilon. And um, when we apply a suitable field redefinition, we can trade this mixing for coupling of the hidden photon to the standard model electromagnetic current, uh, which we denote J here. Um, so um, in essence, the hidden photon couples just like the standard model photon, but with a suppression by the small kinetic mixing parameter. And um, as a result of that, the absorption rate of non-relativistic hidden photons in xenon can be related to the photoelectric cross-section as done here. And uh, the rate scales with one over the hidden photon mass because we assume the hidden photon to make the, up the full dark matter density. Um, because the dark matter um, yeah, because the dark matter here is non-relativistic, um, the absorption would produce a, a monoenergetic peak uh, at the mass of the hidden photon. But this is smeared out significantly by the detector resolution um, because it is only about 20% of the energy range that we're interested in. So we then fitted the hidden photon signal to the observed axis in xenon one ton uh, and get this nice looking result. 
Um, so there's a Gaussian peak on top of the back, but a couple of kV in energy, and this uh, fits the data very well. Um, we can evaluate this in the hidden photon parameter space uh, with the mass plotted here on the x-axis and the kinetic mixing on the y-axis. And we find the best fit point at a mass of 2.8 kV and kinetic mixing of 8.6 times 10 to the minus 16. Uh, we were happy to see that this result uh, was being confirmed by three other papers last week. Um, so we can be quite sure about that. And we also calculate the one and two sigma certainty limits, which are also plotted here uh, on the right. Um, the global significance of this signal is just about two sigma, um, which is less than the solar axon fit, for instance. Uh, but large parts of this smaller significance can be um, attributed to the look elsewhere effect, because changing the mass of the hidden photon would allow us to explain a peak at any position in the spectrum. So it's not so much that the hidden photon fits the data less well, but rather that it would also fit to many other uh, possible observations. So we've seen in the previous talk that the uh, local signi significance is uh, actually above uh, three sigma. Uh, so we can uh, conclude that a hidden photon with a mass between two or three kV can very well explain the excess in xenon uh, one time. So um, because of that, we can proceed with, uh, to the second question. Um, how do hidden photons perform as dark matter? As for all liposonic dark matter candidates, uh, the production in the early universe cannot happen thermally. Uh, because if it did, they would have been relativistic for long enough to prohibit uh, um, structure formation. Uh, luckily, there are a couple of non-thermal production mechanisms uh, which can generate a vector particle like the hidden photon. Um, firstly, there's the misalignment mechanism. This is similar to the pseudo-scalar case, uh, but the energy density stored <coughs> in um, a vector field uh, dilutes during inflation. Uh, this means that a misalignment production for vector fields typically suffers from very large or even super Planckian field values. Mm, another possibility would be the production from fluctuations during inflation. Um, the final yield here only depends on the Hubble scale during inflation and the mass of the hidden photon. So for our 2.8 kV hidden photon, for instance, we would require an inflation scale of 7 times 10 to the 11 GeV. Um, in this approach, one has to be very careful with isocurvature constraints. Um, at scales of the cosmic microwave background, but for uh, vectors, this is mostly less problematic uh, than for scalars. Um, higher scales of inflation are also possible when non-minimal coupling to gravity is included. So what we can do is to add a Lagrangian, um, a term to the Lagrangian like this one, um, where R is the Ricci scalar and kappa an order one parameter. In this case, uh, the Hubble scale during inflation can be as high as 10 to the 14 GeV for the mass of interest. Um, a common outcome of this production from inflationary fluctuations is that a lot of the energy is stored in the small scale fluctuations, but I will come back to that in the end. Um, hidden photons could also be decayed products of other fields like an axion, the dark Higgs, or uh, the inflaton, um, uh, or even cosmic strings. So we can also conclude that there are certainly ways how to produce hidden photons in the early universe. It is also easy to see that instability of the hidden photon will not be a problem uh, because such a light hidden photon um, uh, only decays to uh, three photons with an electron running in the loop. And this is suppressed by a large power of the electron mass, as you can see here, and is completely negligible for a hidden photon mass of 2.8 keV. Um, so all in all, we can say there's no reason why hidden photons should not be dark matter. And uh, now we finally come to the uh, stellar cooling which is what makes the hidden photon interpretation particularly interesting. Um, various kinds of stars can emit light bosons like axions or hidden photons in quite large abundances. And this is essentially because the hot dense stellar plasma is the perfect environment for production. And once these weakly attacking particles are produced, they are streaming freely and can carry away significant amounts of energy. Uh, because of this, uh, stellar cooling can provide strong constraints, but also observations of several kinds of stars point towards a small amount of additional cooling compared to what you would expect from uh, standard models of stellar evolution. So this nice plot from Gianotti et al, we see the additional luminosity related to the expected luminosity for horizontal branch stars, for uh, red giants, and for white dwarfs, which make up all the bottom four variables here. Um, we also see that in some of these systems, additional cooling is observed, which can be interpreted as a hint for uh, light new physics. Um, for hidden photons in our mass range, uh, the horizontal branch stars are the most relevant ones in terms of cooling. 
and uh, their emission of hidden photons is dominated by the conversion of uh, transversal modes. This can actually occur uh, resonantly uh, if the plasma frequency is similar to the mass of the hidden photon. Um, so hidden photon cooling only has a significant impact on the evolution of such a horizontal branch star. Uh, if this resonance condition is fulfilled in some spherical shell it's inside the star. Um, so when we plot the most recent bounds and hints from horizontal branch stars together with our preferred parameters from the xenon one ton anomaly, uh, we get a significant overlap. So horizontal branch stars exclude this lighter area up here and hint towards the darker shaded area labeled HB anomaly. And indeed, um, a hidden photon, just like the one we may have seen in xenon one ton, uh, does not only evade the stellar con cooling constraints, but it's also close enough to the limit as to uh, explain the observed additional cooling of horizontal branch stars. And um, this, we believe, is a nice feature of this interpretation of the excess. Um, one may wonder why the bound and hint have this sharp edge at approximately 2.6 keV. Um, this actually comes from uh, uh, the fact uh, that if the mass of the hidden photon is large, than the uh, maximal value of the plasma frequency, which is at the core of the star, um, then there's no spherical shell in which resonant production can occur. Um, and this core value of the plasma frequency is typically given by something similar to 2.6 kV. And this defines us uh, at this edge. Um, however, the observation leading to this horizontal branch anomaly um, is the smallness of the R parameter, which is the number of horizontal branch stars over the number of red giants in a globular cluster. And uh, this was carefully analyzed by considering many stellar evolution, evolution trajectories, but not including hidden photon cooling, but instead cooling by emission of axions from the free Markov effect. And only later was the observed additional luminosity translated to the case of hidden photons. And that gave the bound that you can see here. And that's why the SINT is certainly somewhere in this region, but what you see in the plot should be considered as an estimate. It would make sense to customize uh, the procedure um, and um, I mean, customize it to the case of hidden photons. And it would be, it's, yeah, it's very well possible that this would extend the hint towards higher masses. Uh, because to lower the R parameter, it may be sufficient to cool some horizontal branch stars with a higher uh, core plasma frequency, but we don't need to cool all of them because this R parameter is an ensemble property. Um, so we are even optimistic that the true overlap may be even larger than uh, shown here. Um, Anyway, uh, this picture that you can see is already quite compelling, we think. So let me also finish with some remarks on how we could test this uh, hidden photon hypothesis. Um, the next generation of direct detection experiments is already being built and we will be able to confirm the access if it is truly there. While um, these will also give us uh, details on the time dependence of the signal. And as we've seen, the hidden photon dark matter typically comes uh, with large fluctuations at small scales, which would result in a clustering of um, events at randomly distributed times. Um, and we've also seen in a previous talk that solar signals would oscillate annually due to the distance between sun and earth, or even if the earth is uh, semi-opaque, you could uh, have a daily modulation. Um, so um, probably that's one of the coolest things about the xenon one ton anomaly. Um, we will definitely know more in the, in the not so distant future. Uh, yeah, and that would already be all from me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions? There's Franceschini in the chat. Eh? Franceschini? Eh? Uh, can you read the chat? Otherwise, I can, I can read ah, for you. Uh, How much stellar structure has to be assumed to make the plot of excess cooling you shown? This is from Roberto Franceschini. How much stellar cooling has to be assumed to make the plot of? Uh, um, okay, so the one I've shown of excess cooling here. I mean, um, that very much depends on, uh, on the stellar system in question. So these are very different uh, system in each case. Um, for um, these, well, what you can see, for instance, in the plot is um, that uh, 
horizontal branch stars are relatively well understood. That's, makes, that's what makes this uh, error bar so, so small. Um, what has to be assumed is uh, the um, dynamic that brings the star from the red giant branch to the horizontal branch uh, when um, uh, the helium flash uh, happens and uh, helium burn burning starts. Um, but these are relatively well understood uh, processes. So this um, uh, hint for the, from the smallness of the R parameter uh, is one of the best um, hints towards access cooling that, that we have. So one of the most reliable ones. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? So I don't see any. So um, I think we can close this uh, morning session. Uh, let me thank all the speakers for uh, uh, the very nice uh, talks. And uh, there will be a second part of this uh, uh, mini session this, uh, um, uh, this afternoon. So see you, see you, see you later. And uh, well, let me just close the session saying that uh, the bottom line is that we have a, a, a very nice anomaly. Uh, if true, this will open a, a very uh, new perspective on uh, dark matter physics, but uh, let, uh, let's also keep in mind that the significance is uh, just the three sigma issue, so it's not uh, too high. So let's try to keep uh, thinking, but uh, uh, bearing in mind that the significance is not terribly high. Okay, so uh, thank you all and uh, see you uh, this afternoon.